Hey guys, well, it's a uh, one small step for man, but one giant leap for astrophotography. I finally managed to get my new scope and uh, everything dragged out outside. It rained all last weekend, it's forecast to rain all next weekend, but I have what could be some decent a couple of days of imaging, so naturally as any uh, uh, responsible adult, I chose to quit work. Well, not quit. I chose not to show up to work, and uh, we'll work on uh, astrophotography for the next couple of days. So I got the scope out. It's balanced. It's ready to go. Everything's set up. The two, the power line and the data line, go back to the house, so I sit back in there. Now, my previous setup was set up right outside that window, and I moved it out to this location. I'm doing the same thing I did before with the... Um, all threads pounded into the ground and so that the legs have a place to to sit now I did this and then probably about a week later the neighbors planted a tree so we'll see how this works uh, certainly I don't expect that tree to grow up anytime real soon um, anyway so my objectives tonight are pretty pretty modest I want to get the system into focus and maybe able to remove one of these spacers depending on how the focusing works out. So that's one critical thing. So doing the focus, getting the guide camera in focus, and then aligning the guide scope with the center of image of the imaging scope. They both have about the same field of view given the chip size for the ASI-174 and the 400 millimeter guide scope versus the chip size, larger chip size for the ASI-174. 1600 and then the longer focal length of the imaging scope so they both have a view of about 1.2 to 1.3 degrees a second objective i have is looking at the focus for all of the all seven of the uh, filters in the filter wheel i want to see how that varies from filter to filter i want to practice taking some sky flats that i may do either this evening uh, before all the fun begins, or I'll do it tomorrow morning. So the critical objectives tonight really are to make sure I can do plate solving, make sure I can get focus, and just practice with the uh, the system. And if all goes well uh, tonight, maybe I can actually do some practice images to figure out what an appropriate gain and offset are for this for the system, since it's new to me. I'm coming from the DSLR world, where I used to take five minute long exposures at uh, ISO 800 and now things are all, all different. So. Okay, so this is the next day after I did my imaging test with the new telescope. I put on the Batonoff mask after centering and focusing on Alcade. And this is a still picture from uh, using the luminance filter that I recorded that night. And what I wanted to do is run through each filter and assess how the Batonoff mask score, focus score, changed over time as I observed in live view mode the changing score. So what you would do here in astrophotography tool is bring up the Batonoff aid. Looks like this. Center the crosshair on the star more or less and that's the kind of information you would get. So it, this distance here is the distance that you're out of focus, meaning the distance in pixels that this green line is off of the ideal location relative to the two diffraction spikes, the two angular diffraction spikes. Now, of course, in a live view mode, this number is constantly changing. And what I did is record the screen during that period and then went back and wrote down all of the values for each filter. And when I would get done with a given filter, close down the Batonoff mask, aid turn off live view go over to the gears tab change the filter to say red filter change go back restart live view it would bring up now a new version of this but using the red filter in this case again go back to the tools menu bring up the batten off aid and start recording and observing the numbers that i would get for the score as that changed over a period of time. And I repeated that for each filter. So I went from luminance, red, green, blue, hydrogen, alpha, oxygen, and sulfur. And then I went back to luminance because it took a period of time when I first uh, did the luminance filter to when I, I got back to the end of the sulfur filter. Now here's a summary of, of the Batonoff scores that I recorded that night for each filter. So each time I would get an update on the screen, I would just record the new value here 
for each filter. So luminance, red, green, blue, hydrogen alpha, and then eventually back to luminance. This line up here represents the average of these numbers, which as you can see, varied quite a bit from 0 0.17, 0 0.51. So there's a good bit of variability here in these numbers, which is due to seeing, of course, and due to some extent, the, the algorithm used to identify the diffraction spike lines uh, is, has got some error in it as well. And as you can see, going across here, the average score for red was a bit more out of focus. Green was more or less in line with the luminance filter. Blue was even better uh, on average than the luminance filter. And then you get into hydrogen, alpha, oxygen, sulfur. They're all very similar in terms of their average focus score. So did not get much variability in these in these filters, which is good news because as a general rule, when you're imaging on a given target, you'll either be using the LRGB or the hydro the narrow band filters. And if you decided you were doing a narrow band target, you could focus on one of those, say H alpha, use H alpha, focus on H alpha, and you'd be set really for all intents and practical purposes. Uh, for focus on the other two filters. But then I went back to luminance after this whole series of measurements were recorded, and you can notice that the average number for the luminance filter when I came back to it is a little bit worse than the average number that I recorded the first time I went through the numbers with the luminance filter, which suggests that my focus was, was I was losing a bit of focus, if you believe these numbers. And I think there is some reason to believe them, as I'll show you when I, when I show you a couple of, of pictures that I took that night. These numbers serve as a, as a guide for creating a probability distribution of the focus that I was getting out of each filter. And here's what that is. This first black, solid black line is the first luminance filter. And so this peak of this probability density means it's, the focus more often than not was right around the average, that's the peak, and then it varied, as you can see, coming off by v values plus or minus from that. Now, the first thing to notice is, in all cases here, every filter produced a variability in focus that was within one pixel, so that's very good. So what that's saying is, basically, you don't have to worry too much about changing the focus in between uh, filter changes. I suppose one conclusion from this is, that you could focus using the luminance or the green filter and uh, stick with that, use that number as your uh, focus, as your number for focus for all of the filters, and you'd be perfectly fine. I think you could also focus on, if you're doing only narrow band imaging, that's these three spe uh, peaks here, use hydrogen alpha to focus on, and then you'll be set for focusing plus or minus with the uh, oxygen and sulfur filters. Now let's take a look at a couple of the pictures because I think this difference in the luminance focus appeared to get a little bit worse, a little bit more out of focus as time went on. All right, here we are in Pix Insight. This is one sub from that evening's imaging and here I was focused on M101. You could just barely make it out here. Now something I noticed, and we'll go back to this in a second, is that I was actually recording in RAW 8 format instead of RAW 16. I didn't realize the ASCOM camera driver for the ZWO 1600 defaults to a RAW 8 format. So all of these images that I ended up taking that night are uh, certainly just practice images, but they are not, they don't have the bit depth that they should have. Another thing that was kind of interesting, if I zoom in on the star here, this is one of the last images I took focusing on M101 as the evening wore on, M101 approached the meridian, and so it was almost directly overhead when I stopped imaging. So when I was taking pictures with the blue filter here and the toward the end of the of the imaging session, the telescope was basically pointed up and the camera was hanging off the focuser. And if you can see you're starting to get the telltale signs of that donut shape for an out of focus star. And if I scroll over to the edge of the photograph, you can really start to see it here. I'm getting that donut effect out here, particularly on the edge of the photograph. Now let's go way over to the other edge. Yeah, now see here it seems to be quite a bit more obvious that I'm out of focus on this side. This may indicate two things. First of all, I was losing focus over time because the weight of the camera hanging off the focuser was being transferred more and more down the axis of the focuser as the scope proceeded to point vertically. 
Second thing is I'm seeing a little bit of variation in focus from the left side to the right side, which may indicate that that three thumb screw arrangement kind of creating a misalignment, if you will, of the sensor. So it's the I may get better focus on one edge of the sensor than the other edge. These are all things I need to learn how to deal with, how to manage. I did not tighten the focus lock screw nearly as much as it should have been. So now let's take a look at a stacked image. I recorded data for two hours, roughly distributed equally among the, the four filters. This is an image I took a couple of years ago. It's two hours worth of data using the DSLR and the uh, Smith Cassegrain. So it has a focal length of 2,350 and it's stacked. I used flats and darks in this case to uh, pre-process the data. There's been no other than a screen stretch. There's been no uh, actual processing of the data. It's just raw, more or less raw data. Here's the corresponding image I got last night or the other night. Now, obviously I have a larger focal, uh, a uh, shorter focal length. So I have a wider field of view. So the, the galaxy is not as, it's not as large in this field of view as it is in my Smith Cassegrain view. Another thing to notice is that some of these stars, as I zoom in on it, okay, these stars are, several stars in here are, are uh, totally saturated. So what that's saying is that even though my exposure was fairly short at 200 seconds and a gain of 10, I probably still need to experiment a little more um, to see if I can I could do a better job. It may be that I have to go ahead and blow some stars that will just get blown out and I can go back in with some shorter duration exposures and replace those stars if I want to retain the star color there. But uh, that is one thing I noticed is that I was, I was blowing out those stars. Now, again, it may be that I'm also, I don't have the bit depth that I should have given that I I'm filming or recording in raw eight as opposed to raw 16. But here's, Here's a comparison of the two images for two hours of data. It looks promising. I was a little disappointed when I first saw this, but I think I've, I'm a little happier now realizing this is actually raw eight instead of raw 16. So hopefully the next time I do this, I can get a better comparison, get better data, more appropriate data. This image, I didn't take any darks. I was at minus 10 C on the sensor temperature here. The sensor temperature is probably around 25 C. So there's a good 35 C difference in temperature between these two sensors. So all in all, I think it was a fairly successful night out for the first light imaging. I wasn't really intending to do any serious imaging. And as it turned out, I didn't do any serious imaging, but I was able to confirm that I could get the plate solving working that worked flawlessly. I got familiar with astrophotography tool. I think it's a great piece of software. It's very easy to use, uh, very convenient. So I, I'm going to enjoy using that software. Um, I found out a couple of quirks about the software in combination with the ASCOM driver for the ZWO camera. At present, Astrophotography Tool does not have direct support of the uh, native support of the ZWO cameras. I think that's coming up in a in a new version sometime in the near future, I think. There was not as much of an improvement in guiding as I had expected, given that I've reduced the weight of the uh, imaging system quite a bit with the 714, with the ED-102 and this camera. Uh, but again, that could be that I'm just out of practice since I haven't done it in well over a year now. But as a first time out, I think I was able to confirm that everything is working and, and I got some of the bugs out of the system. So the next time I go out, I can probably do a, hopefully a better job and some actual imaging. All right, guys. Well, that's all I've got from here. I'll talk to you later.